But in the United States, uh, up until I believe 2012 or 2013, up until recently, you could patent DNA strands. So up to, uh, I believe it was over 20% of the known human DNA strands were uh, you know, patented by private corporations, specifically, uh, or, or were patents that were owned by private corporations, specifically pharmaceutical corporations. Every drug, every medicine, you know, when a coronavirus vaccine comes out, you know that shit's patented. I mean, you know the coronavirus is patented. You know, um, which I, I haven't looked too much into that, but that shit just sounds bonkers, crazy. I, I don't understand that necessarily, but, you know, whatever. Um, people, but people who were patenting DNA strands were basically, the, I'll tell you how this, w this, this w would look. You can't do this anymore. It was ruled unconstitutional. Um, and I'll tell you why in, at the end of the today, but basically, you know, with uh, DNA, if you patented a certain DNA, let's say, let's just say a DNA, uh, you found like a DNA strand that was responsible for breast cancer and you patented that. This would mean multiple things. This would mean that uh, number one, you could prevent anybody else from doing anything with that DNA now the most important thing would be researching on cures. So you could prevent other pharmaceutical companies or independent inventors from, uh, from basically uh, coming up with a cure for breast cancer. In order for them to test or use uh, you know, that strain that you know, created that type of breast cancer, they would have to license from you the right to use that strain. In the end, that would drive up the overall costs of research and development, and those overall costs would be bestowed upon whom? The cancer patient, okay? So this was ruled un unconstitutional. Now there's a long, long, long history in the United States, and sp particularly with pharmaceutical companies, of sending anthropologists to indigenous communities. And these anthropologists would, uh, you know, uh, get into these indigenous communities and they would, uh, ask them about what type of cures or what kind of you know, herbal medicines would you use for certain ailments. Uh, and then they would bring that information back to the company and the company would figure out how to turn that into a patentable drug. And those patentable, patentable drugs would often be sold back to those communities at, at an expense. Now, you have to know that like, there are differences um, in, in all of this, you know, in the sense of like HIV, let's say HIV uh, medicine, that costs thousands of dollars here, costs five or six dollars in Africa. Um, you know, uh, other countries, you know, have just decided to infringe on this. Uh, you know, like Brazil has just decided to, you know, fuck it, you know, fuck you, Pfizer, whoever owns that, we're gonna just make, we're just gonna make, make the drug. Um, the other major, major thing with patents is that you can patent um, uh, seeds. Now, where this becomes particularly interesting is uh, a company we all know called Monsanto. And what Monsanto has is a pesticide called Ready Roundup. And a lot of commercial farmers use this because it, um, it kills weeds. Now, however, if you spray it on your crop, it's going to kill your crop. So Monsanto came up with genetically modified seeds that do not die when they're sprayed with its, damn, with its uh, uh, ready roundup. Okay. Now, this means this. When a farmer buys a bag of seeds, a pack of seeds, whatever, and they they open that pack of seeds, they're agreeing to the patent license. Basically, they're saying this, is that uh, at the end of the season, I will not save my seeds. Now, seed saving, as we'll learn, is like an agricultural tradition. You have a crop, you save your seeds for the next year, you plant those seeds. You're not allowed to do that with Monsanto GM, non, uh, GMO seeds. If you do that, it's patent infringement, and they have sued the shit out of many, many farmers. If you're, uh, you have a farm that's, and you don't use Monsanto seeds, uh, 
and someone next to you, the farm next to you, their, their, you know, their seeds, let's say, end up on your property. They blow onto your property. They pollinate, uh, you know, whatever. Like there's the genetics of those seeds are on your, your property. You can be sued for patent infringement, although you never did. Now, this, both of these instances came up in 2012 in the Supreme Court. Uh, genetics, you know, DNA is DNA patentable subject matter and is uh, can you patent seeds, food, essentially. And the Supreme Court said no on DNA because you just find it. Oh, there's a hummingbird, hummingbird over there. Uh, no, because you just find it. So cool. Um, you just discover it, DNA. You don't actually invent anything. But with seeds, you actually are in, in inventing something. Um, so, I mean, this kind of shows you, you know, a little bit about maybe the darker side of patent. But you have to understand almost everything that we put into our body, food, uh, drugs, et cetera, that are not, you know, natural, but even those could be patented, um, you know, are all patented things. Like most, so many, so much of what we enjoy in this world. So like when we're talking about trademark, we're talking about copyright, we're talking about content, we're talking about movies and music, we're talking about brands, you know, things that are important to like our identity. But when we're talking about patent, we're talking about health in our bodies. And I mean, there's just so much that you can patent. Like, if you ever use one-click checkout on Amazon, that's an Amazon patent. Just, I mean, just think about, think about, there's just so many things that you use on a daily basis that, that are patented. You may have no idea about. All right, so we're going to watch this uh, eight-minute clip from Seeds of Freedom. This is going to get into uh, the patenting of seeds and kind of show you a little bit about the effects of seed patenting uh, globally and right here you can see the uh, pat uh, the patent from I believe what is it the early 1930s or mid 1930s for the avocado um, so I mean just again like I want you to watch this kind of think about this because I, I think it does highlight some of the importance of patent and kind of having having an eye out for this because really what what happens everything that's patentable right it costs more to research and develop on things that are patentable. It costs more, uh, basically everything costs more that's patentable. And that cost ultimately comes back to you as consumers. It comes back to you and allows for companies to monopolize technology, to monopolize cures. It allows them to price fix and set prices for things, uh, you know, that, that drive them up and reduce competition. I mean, it's anti-competitive in so, in so many ways. Now, in other ways, it allows companies to be able to share ideas or protect their ideas and invest in important ideas. So it's kind of this, like, weird betwixt and between. Like, it's like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And you have to kind of, you know, f balance, like, patenting versus like what should be accessible to everybody like <laughs> cares for stuff <laughs> like just wait when like a coronavirus vaccine comes out like whoever comes up with that and you should watch who actually patents that and how that all comes down whoever owns that is going to be one rich 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 company all right, so we'll check out Seeds of Freedom. We'll come back and we'll get more into patent. Or as they say in the UK, patent. The pieces are linked together in two intertwined chains, forming a framework like a long spiral staircase. And in this molecule, you have an essential quality of living matter, the ability to reproduce, to make copies of itself, and of all the molecules known to chemistry, only DNA and its relatives have this ability. In 1953, Watson and Crick's discovery of the DNA double helix set the stage for one of science's most rapid advances, genetic engineering, the ability to move genes between cells, organisms, and species soon became feasible. In agriculture, the possibilities of such engineering seemed limitless. Higher yields, greater resilience to drought, better flavor, and quicker maturation. But as this new technology emerged, 
It was accompanied by fierce debate as to its ethics. Meanwhile, the most significant role of this new technology was being decided not in the field, but in the courtroom. The United States Constitution gives Congress the power to pass laws relating to patents that gives its owner certain rights to an invention. Those include the right to keep others from making, using, selling, or offering for sale the invention that is described in the patent. Intellectual property laws had long asserted that patents could be claimed on new and proven inventions. But in 1995, the World Trade Organization proposed a radical change in international law. Under pressure from global corporations, they ruled that microorganisms and microbiological processes already existing in nature could be patented. Under this new law, a seed could be genetically engineered to contain particular genes which could then be patented and privately owned. As far as the seed is concerned, this leap in terms of property rights on life itself is the most serious threat to seeds of diversity, seeds of freedom that are in the hands of peasants. A year later, the agrochemical giant Monsanto produced the first GM crop in America, Roundup Ready Soya, which was quickly followed by GM corn and canola. The genetically modified seeds contained a single novel trait. They'd been engineered specifically to resist the toxic effects of the chemical herbicide Roundup, Monsanto's number one selling herbicide since the 1980s. To put in a gene for herbicide resistance, you now have a monopoly on the chemical as well, on this, as well as on the seed that is married to the chemical. They are chemical companies first, but they are seed companies second. That is their principle. If you can control the seed, you control the profit from growing food. You create a monopoly when you're providing seeds which have been engineered to be resistant to the pesticides that are used on those seeds. The effect of that is that we're seeing a vastly increased use of pesticides, which is one of the things that GM was supposed to be tackling. Twenty years since GM first hit our markets, the promises of early research remain unfulfilled. Roundup Ready technology dominates the GM market in America, and now the story of seed would return to the courtroom as the full implications of patent law became clear to the world. And I'll never forget when my wife and I left our door here, the front door, my wife turned around and said, I hope to God I have a roof over my house, over my head tonight when I come home. That's how close we were to lose everything. We had put everything on the line. And I, I feel sorry for the farmers that didn't have that opportunity have lost their farms, hundreds of them. Canadian farmer Percy Schmeiser had been growing canola, saving and breeding the seed for 50 years. But in 1998, some of his seed was found to contain the patented Roundup Ready gene. Whether it's seeds blown in from your neighbor's field, pollen flow by the wind or from bees, if that happens to you, you no longer own your seeds to plants, they immediately under patent law, become the ownership of the corporation. Percy was taken to the Canadian Federal Court for patent infringement. His defense, that the GM presence was accidental, was rejected by the court, and in 2000, he was found guilty. They had no record of us ever obtaining their seeds or buying their seed, but they said because our neighbor grew it and contaminated us, we should not have been using our seed. We ought to or should have known. Well, that's completely impossible. A canola seed, whether it's genetic altered or not, or organic, it's identically the same unless you do DNA testing. To date, over 140 US farmers have been prosecuted for the infringement of intellectual property over seeds. Thousands more have been investigated for so-called seed piracy. What are we supposed to do with seeds? Seeds are supposed to be planted, multiplied, used, further adapted, etc., etc. That's exactly what's not allowed from a corporate mindset. The corporations sell us the seed or license us 
to use the seed in a specific way, in the way they are interested to use it. Full stop. By controlling the seed, you control the farmer. By controlling the farmer, you control the whole food system. And that's the legacy of genetics in farming. Today, the GM market has spread beyond North America and established itself in Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, and now in India. Whilst the GM industry claims to be increasing yields and improving lives, more and more farmers are reporting new and unexpected problems. In the Indian state of Gujarat, hundreds of thousands of farmers persuaded to grow genetically modified BT cotton, a crop which produces its own pesticide, found that in time the pests developed their own resistance to the crop. The rise of these super pests has forced the farmers to use ever stronger pesticides. Instead of controlling pests and controlling weeds, you are getting super pests and super weeds. So even in the narrow domain of weed control and pest control, the technology is failing. With the rising cost of seeds, fertilizers and pesticides, many farmers have been forced into a spiral of debt. And the spread of GM cotton has been linked to a tragic increase of suicides among Indian farmers.